Good evening, everyone. My name is Chandler Johnson. I am the manager of casting and the apprentice program at the Santa Fe Opera. Thank you all for joining us tonight here at the Guggenheim for Works in Process. The Santa Fe Opera is a summer festival based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. In 2022, we were named Festival of the Year at the International Opera Awards in Madrid. Tonight, I'm so excited to sit down with composer Gregory Spears, librettist Tracy K. Smith, and director Kevin Newberry to share excerpts and discuss this brilliant new opera, The Righteous, set to make its world premiere at the Santa Fe Opera in our 2024 season. Greg? Thanks, Chandler. I'm Gregory Spears. I'm the composer of The Righteous. Um, I just first of all want to say how wonderful it is to be up here with my colleagues, uh, Tracy and Kevin, and then Chandler has been such a sort of close ally as this project has gone on and been in rehearsals and given us some great advice, so it's an honor to be up here with you all. Um, I also want to thank the Santa Fe Opera, uh, they, who commissioned this piece and has lovingly developed it uh, for, you know, a few years, quite a few years now, and we're so excited that it's going to um, hit the stage uh, this summer. Um, we had uh, two piano vocal workshops where we went through the entire piece. It's a big piece, um, has many, many characters, a chorus, a uh, large orchestra, over two hours of music, so it's a, it's a large-scale work. And for this program in the last few days, we really wanted to zoom in on some arias and some intimate moments, so not the big... Uh, you know, uh, crowd scenes, so to speak, but the scenes that are really uh, more internal. And this piece is about spirituality, and so um, the aria becomes a, a vehicle for getting into the minds of these characters who are trying to make a connection to something larger than themselves. So um, that's what we're going to uh, preview today with these wonderful singers and pianists who I'd like to thank in advance as well. Um, and Tracy's going to give us a little bit of context about the story so you can place these moments. Yeah. Um... The Righteous is the second work that Greg and Kevin and I have worked on, uh, creating together, and it follows along with our interest in history. And the way, not just as a remote or discrete field of study, but as something we live with, and something that it feels oftentimes disconcertingly so, um, that bumps up against us, that, that um, announces it's waiting for us to finish, resolve, um, complete work from a, a generation or a century or, you know, maybe some of the characters in our work also give echoes back to, you know, what we think of as ancient or biblical history. Um, but this is a work that takes place in the American Southwest um, among a church congregation. And I think it's a, it's a story about self-finding and self-making. And God is a vehicle for that for many people. Um, David is one of them. He's a preacher who, um, as we'll hear in, in uh, his early aria, uh, feels that God was his first love. And so we watch him move along building a congregation, developing a sense of voice and building his own charisma, so much so that he becomes um, a very powerful public figure, somebody who is drawn into um, the, the field of politics. Um, and so his faith changes as his own personal power grows. Um, and he is, you know, in community with other characters who are here tonight. Um, Michelle is his first wife, <laughs> Megan. Um, and um, she's somebody who grew up with David. Um, she and her brother have known him, let's say, all their lives. Um, and has, you know, looked, on, looked toward him with admiration and eventually love. Um, and so they end up marrying as this congregation is just budding. Um, their relationship changes, and I think Michelle begins to realize that finding love isn't the resolution of her life. And so we witness her journey progress and, and um, unfold. And then there's Sheila, who's voiced by Amber, um, and she's a parishioner. I don't know if that's the right word for a Protestant um, congregation, but she's a member of the congregation who is a military wife. She's got a young child, and she's somebody who brings her own particular vocabulary of belief 
she's somebody who had a difficult childhood, felt very alone um, and unsafe at many points. And God emerged for her as a quiet voice that she heard during moments of despair, telling her, I know you, I love you. And so the theology that she brings in is very different from what um, David is preaching, which is active and loud and God comes down from above. Um, so she brings an interesting counterpoint. Um, she's interesting and alluring to David because of this difference in, in her uh, vision of faith, and they end up falling in love, and she becomes David's second wife, and as he ventures into politics, she ends up becoming the first lady of their state. So we witness, you know, in some ways, people finding and losing themselves and, and, and seeing what it feels like to reflect on that kind of a journey. And uh, we should just add that the story takes place in the 1980s. So the, the first section is 1979, and then we move to 1986, and the piece ends in 1990. So it really takes on uh, the entire decade, which is also the decade that was very formative for us growing up. You know, Tracy, uh, can you talk to us about your your writing style? Like, you know, the the vehicle in which you wrote a lot of these these arias that we're actually talking about. You know, actually, when I was reading the libretto the first time, I said, "Wow, this feels almost psalm-like." You know what I mean? So, can you talk to us about that? Yeah, well, because you know, the biblical David is is a shadow figure in this mm -hmm. text. The psalm was something that I really wanted to lean toward or gesture toward. Um, I had to find a form that I felt at home in mm -hmm. in order to form a, a new vocabulary of intimacy with God, if you will. And so the form that I chose is the villanelle. And it's a poetic form that's rooted in uh, direct repetition and a closed rhyme scheme. So you, there are two refrains. Um, and each recurs several times throughout the course of the poem, but it begins to tilt and shift and sometimes undermine uh, previous iterations. And I think it's a really great form for thinking about obsession, for thinking about compromise, for thinking about the ways we resolve and then suddenly find that we've disrupted everything um, over and over again in the course of a life. Um, and I felt like it was a, a container that would allow me, through these characters, to think about what growth feels like and what the obstacles to growth um, that we sometimes choose feel like as well. Yeah, absolutely. To set the scene, it's 1979, and David is hunting with a group of men in the countryside. Paul, father of Jonathan and Michelle, asks David to lead the group of men in a prayer.
So, Greg, can you talk about how you use the villanelle um, to actually come up with the composition and how you added that into your writing process? I mean, you know, we kind of have a villanelle form in writing, which would be A, B, A prime. So how did you, when coming up with the aria, and the arias, I should say, how did you let that kind of influence your writing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, the Villanelle became sort of a very early theme in the collaboration around this. And, um, and, and for me, the Villanelle is a way to negotiate between symmetry and change and repetition and change. And just as you say, uh, music, and this is, sounds very kind of nerdy, but music is all about the paradox between how can something repeat and then change at the same time. And the classic example for me is the Da Capo aria and Handel. You have, so, you have a statement. Uh, an affect, then there's a contrasting section, and then the singer returns to the first section, different. Even though the music is very similar, they're different because they've traveled through the crisis or the, the contrast of the B section. And the Villanelle is doing this in very complicated ways that sometimes does the opposite of resolve. It actually opens up ambigu ambiguity and doubt, mm -hmm. which is very central to characters negotiating their faith and sort of working out their salvation. And, um, so I thought about that a lot, and, and, and one of the things I want to say, which you won't hear tonight, is the larger design of this piece, which is quite a, you know, a long piece, actually has this symmetry built into the way that the scenes sort of progress, where you'll, you'll get music, and then it'll go away, and then it'll return, and then another thing will be introduced, and then that will go away and return, and then the first piece of music becomes the B section for that. So there's a kind of interweaving, just like the Villanelle. So music is always coming back in different contexts that, um, in a way, sort of traces on a small level what happens in these arias which are characters struggling to sort of work out something in their lives. Um, and the aria that we're about to hear, um, uh, Tracy wrote the text, which is in your uh, program, and I actually asked her, could I bring the beginning of the text back at the end? So we made it into a little da capo. So you'll hear one section um, that's slower and more soaring, then you hear a very long section that slowly builds, that has a lot of sort of bel canto, which means very florid, vocal writing, and then, um, and then we'll actually return to the opening section again, but with a difference. And this is an aria I also want to say, one of the things I love about the technology of the aria, this inherited tradition, is the way in which it, in, in, there's examples of this in the repertoire where it's not just a setting of a text, the music and the voice is trying to actually embody the idea in the text. So in this case, it's a character trying to decide um, how, uh, you know, how God sort of visits her, right? And so as she builds in the music, the, um, uh, hopefully the music shows you how that happens. It's not just a description of an event. It's actually an action. Great. So in uh, this next scene, it's still 1979. After church one Sunday, David, who is now married to Michelle, meets Sheila, a parishioner in his church, and asks her if she would like to lead a women's group. And uh, Sheila sings this aria, sharing what faith and spirituality mean to her.
the next aria, you'll be introduced to Michelle. David and Michelle are at home following a church event. David's charisma and leadership skills have led to whispers of his potential emergence as a writing candidate for governor. And Michelle's father, Paul, is worried that David's big personality is a threat to Paul's own gubernatorial re-election campaign. Michelle asks David to make a public statement that he has no intention of running against Paul. So, Kevin, we have, we've seen these characters and we kind of see where they are in their life, but what's happening? How, do you, how are you going to depict what's happening you know, around them, in the world around them? Uh, so one of the exciting things about this piece is that we traverse a whole decade, as I said, and in addition to you know, amazing hair and clothes that will tell us what time period we're in, we're also doing something quite interesting, I think, with, uh, with media in this piece, and that we're using media in a diegetic way, which is a, a film term that means the characters actually see 
the things, right? It's like hearing the music on a radio in a movie. They're, that's a diegetic choice. So we have small TVs that are just in scenes throughout the piece that are just playing in the background, maybe for 30 or 40 seconds as a character turns them off, reacting to the Iranian hostage crisis or the AIDS crisis. Uh, I was born in 1977, and the things that I saw on television made a really big impact on me. My parents watched the NBC Nightly News, the Tom Brokaw, every night. I watched it from a very early age. Uh, one of the characters you aren't meeting tonight is Jonathan, who is Michelle's brother and David's best friend, who is gay and very much in the closet. And so we, we get a real sense of time period just by what's playing on in the background during certain scenes, not in a way that's distracting, but that just kind of influences the character's lives. So, for instance, you see Carter, uh, President Carter, President Reagan, and President Bush over the course of these three time periods. So it, it gives you a sense of what, what year we're actually in. Tracy, would you like to set the next scene? Sure. Um, so we just saw a little bit of the rift that seems to be developing between Michelle and David. Um, in this next scene, um, Michelle, who has just come from a session of the ladies' ministry that Sheila's leading, um, meets David outside after he's just come from the deacons meeting where they're talking about the expansion plans for the church and wonderful donations that are making all of this possible. Um, and she begins to realize as David runs back um, into the church where Michelle knows Sheila's waiting, that there's more to the story of their marriage than she's allowed herself to see. And I think this is where doubt becomes concrete in her mind. And uh, we're now in 1986.
so Tracy and Greg, um, kind of thinking about the next aria that we'll hear, you know, Sheila finds inspiration in the landscape and I mean, she's not the only character that talks about nature and the influence of nature. I mean, the opening scene is, you know, in the woods. Um, and there's another scene where, you know, Jonathan and David are on a rock. So nature plays a big part in this. And I guess I can loop Kevin into this as far as the direction is concerned. You know, how will the landscape in Santa Fe play a big part in this writing? How has it played a big part in this writing? I'll start by saying, um, you know, we know the history of every bit of land on this planet is ancient, but in the American mythology, the West is something that is always viewed as new, mm -hmm. a place where a new history can be made, you know, albeit overwriting existing history. And so um, the landscape in some ways, especially for a character like David, is a site of self-making. Mm -hmm. It's a site of, you know, conquest. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a place where a character can feel both alone and accompanied, you know? So David maybe feels himself accompanied by a god who's saying, yes, yes, go, you're doing my will. Whereas uh, Sheila feels herself accompanied with a very different version of, of a, a creator or a deity. Um, we don't see this or hear this scene tonight, but there's a moment where Michelle feels that um, her certainty about the, you know, unspiraling of her marriage is echoed or even foreshadowed by the sounds of nature, the, the trees and the water are sort of like in solidarity with her. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in some ways that's kind of true to life. Yeah. We, we find ourselves in these other life forces or presences. Mm -hmm. It's nice that the audience will be able to be outside as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just add to that, you know, Santa Fe has this sort of uh, picture window to the heavens in a way that looks out the back um, that's so often used in productions. And to me, you know, it is the setting of the story. It's in the American Southwest and it has that mythic quality to it. Um, but there's a way in which Santa Fe frames that and so we can actually see it. So, so much of the story is about the sublime is everywhere around us, but sometimes we see it and sometimes we just can't see it. You know, whatever our flaws are sort of gets in the way. And so to have these characters surrounded by this beauty and also surrounded by music, which depending on how you think of opera philosophically, they may or may not be hearing, right? They might just be going about there every day. We hear them singing arias. And so there's this sort of divine dimension, uh, you know, um, that, uh, that is just surrounding this theater mm -hmm. that I think adds a kind of um, uh, a mystical quality. Sheila, I think, is a, real, is a real true mystic. And so she's the one who, in the aria that's coming up, really talks about, she's making a, a sort of political speech, but she talks about nature around her and that leads her to a revelation. Yeah. And uh, as I introduce the next piece, I'll just add that the, the scenic design by the wonderful Mimi Lian will reveal nature at key moments that I think relate very deeply to this idea of mysticism and God, whereas everything the, the actors touch on stage is very real. The books they carry, their Sony Walkman, the wood paneling in the office, right? The wallpaper, everything feels very real. I'm particularly excited about David and Michelle's bathroom with the pink tile and the glass, but it's like right out of a dynasty or something. Uh, but we see nature in these really beautiful spiritual moments. Uh, so in the next scene, uh, we are now in 1990, so moving right along in our timeline, following a long affair and the dissolution of David and Michelle's marriage, David and Sheila are now married. David is also now governor. At a reception in the governor's mansion, Sheila, deeply moved by a visit from another wonderful character that you're not meeting tonight named Jacob, who is a young pastor from a struggling city community. Sheila makes some remarks to the press.
I guess this next question I would like to open up to the, to the panel. You know, we see these characters and how they have developed, you know, in 10 or 12 year span, you know, we say the decade, but, you know, how they have, how they have changed, how they start to take on new language. I mean, Kevin, you know, looking at the costumes, how they morph from one, you know, one identity to almost a new identity. So it's, and I would even say in the some of the writing too, Greg, how you know they have taken on new ideas. What was your biggest? Um, who do you think you? I guess this is a, that's the question. Who do you think you had the most fun writing that change? Uh. <laughs> well, I could start by saying you know the the, the Sheila and Michelle. Um, really sort of start to take over the narrative to a great extent as the piece goes and as the music actually gets more and more virtuosic. And, and I believe so much in, in, in opera and in the voice and, um, and singers. Um, and so I think that a lot of the character development comes through the voice and as the voice can be put to use as, as some sort of, maybe some sort of metaphorical or even just sort of directly visceral relationship to what Tracy's written. And so as the piece goes, we start to, to understand hopefully more about how the voice itself and these different sort of abstract ABA forms and things that sound very intellectual can actually connect with something like the spiritual experience or the, his, you know, the history of this country and the sort of complexities of, of what it feels like to be alive. Yeah, I agree. It's the women that uh, we see change their uh, narrative arc, mm -hmm. um, probably the most. I like the way that in Sheila's vocabulary, you know, her centering um, source is a, a form of faith, but she begins to look out at the world in this work. So she starts perhaps by feeling uh, convicted by a conversation with Jacob that Kevin mentioned. So she's thinking about people beyond the community that she's rooted in. And she begins to um, second guess. You know, we hear even in that moment, she's got some remarks that she was ready to make. And then she realizes she thinks something different is important to say. And she's a character whose questions we get to see and hear um, over the course of the second half of the opera. And it was fun to, um, you know, we didn't want to do a send up of religion in this work. I didn't come with the sense of um, satire as being useful or attractive in this context, although I know it's been used. I really wanted to think about what, what our or people's belief in something that could be real and mysterious affords them and what entices them to shift those terms. Mm -hmm. um, and so Sheila's a character who I think begins to realize that faith isn't something that's really just about an individual. It changes one's worldview. Mm -hmm. And so she starts to care um, in ways that transform her. We see it in costuming, we hear it in the vocabulary. Um, and I think we, we see it in the choices that she makes as well. Sure. In our next scene, Sheila has made a generous gift to a local women's shelter and goes there to offer her services as a group leader. There, she runs into Michelle, who is there as legal counsel. Though no forgiveness is sought nor offered, the two seem almost relieved to see each other after so many years.
Tracy, revisiting kind of where we started tonight um, with the discussion about the Villanelle, we also find David in his last aria at that same place. Um, can you talk to us about the growth that the character has had and, you know, why you chose to give David another psalm-like aria um, to end the show? Uh, there's a moment in um, in another scene where David is talking to Sheila and Sheila's daughter and Sheila's daughter's roommate. And he says, oh, I've always loved the Psalms. They're songs of hope and consolation. Um, at this point, at the end of the show, David has felt himself, you know, he's moved away from most of the relationships that he started the show invested in. Um, he's just had what is perhaps a final conversation with, with Jonathan. And he's also crossed a new bridge in terms of the allegiances that he's, he's going to commit to or, or considering committing to in his life as governor. And I think it, it feels like there's a moment where he kind of is looking at himself in the third person. Mm -hmm. And he's thinking about what what he's let go of or, or lost sight of. Mm -hmm. And so the final um, aria that he has, and it's actually, um, the text is something that um, is sung by a large chorus after mm -hmm. David's um, aria concludes, is a way of thinking about life, failure, mm -hmm. humility, mm -hmm. um, at the end of, of a story, which really isn't, you know, it's not the end of his life story. Oh. It's not the end of anybody's um, story in the work, but it's a, a place where a, a vista becomes, oh. um, becomes visible. So I'll read the text of the yeah, final please. villanelle. Life is long and wisdom slow. I thought I knew. What did I know? Joy arrives, joy goes, likewise truth. Life is long and wisdom slow. If I was a seed, then, oh, what was the soil in which I grew? What do I know? What is the heart? Where the soul? Once I knew, life is long, wisdom slow. What is the heart? Where the soul? Am I the many or the few? How will I know? Oh, Lord God, oh, what did I mistake for you? How will I know? Life is long and wisdom slow.
So why an original story? Why now? And why opera as the medium to tell that original story? I feel like sometimes we get used to the stories we know, and they become myth in a way. They, they justify the perspectives that we hold. And sometimes a new story can jostle us out of those kinds of certainties. Um, and we have, um, we have a lot to deal with right now. You know, this, uh, this work talks about, you know, the, the early language of the war on drugs and the intolerance of the gay lifestyle that was voiced so freely during, you know, from political leaders during the AIDS crisis. And those perspectives are with us now in, in terms of new, um, new questions and conflicts and inequalities. And I feel like looking backwards might give us a little bit more courage to think about how we continue to fail. Mm. I'll add to that, uh, you know, opera's kind of an old form, right? <laughs> and I just get this kind of thrill, like thinking about like bel canto singing and thinking what, like, what if we have like, um, you know, the governor of Texas doing like bel canto singing. There's something in, <laughs> there's something in that kind of weirdness actually. It's like super strange. And I think that we sometimes have to make our own world, these are our stories, right? We have to make it a little strange for it to kind of get into our heart again. Um, uh, and we have a lot of like really kind of art forms that we're very used to, that feel very comfortable to us, that are in our homes and everything. And, and opera's so strange and wonderful and powerful, sort of burrows into your heart. It has something to do with the contradictions. That's what the villanelle has to do with. It's about working through contradictions in a way that you don't resolve them, but they kind of stick with you in a way that, that gives you heart, I think. I'm getting a little philosophical. But there's something about doing these new stories that are our stories. We're all, you know, similar age, so, the 80s is sort of our origin story, and, and I think of it very differently now that I look back on it than when I was, you know, five. Um, <laughs> you do the math in that one. Uh, but I think that there's something really unique in that combination of doing something new that's ours and also this art form that's old, and, and there's a power there, hopefully. Um, yeah, and I'll just sort of add in closing that you know, I think we're, we're living in the, the midst of one of the most, probably the most seismic shift in how we communicate and relate to each other as a species, you know, coming out of the trauma of the COVID crisis and, the, and looking at the advent of technology and AI, and, and here we are learning how to, how to connect again. And, and uh, I think this story, as Greg and Tracy said, it, it looks back on on the kind of origin of the, the 80s and how it led to where we are today in many ways. And, and look, some of our favorite pieces have been based on, on novels and real figures and films, but this is the second piece that, that Greg and Tracy have written together. The first, Castor and Patience, last summer premiered in Cincinnati, is also an original story. And I get very emotional hearing this music and these characters come to life because we're, we're just getting to know who these characters are right now. You can't say, oh, Julia Roberts played it in the movie and that's what's in your mind, right? Um, and I also just wanna say that uh, if you've been living with Greg's music for the last decade, as I've had the honor of, of collaborating with, with Greg on, on so many wonderful pieces, when you hear Greg's choral writing and writing for a big orchestra alongside these very intimate character scenes, you are in for a real treat and definitely as always with our work, bring your, uh, bring your tissues with you. So um, just wanna, uh, any other last final words? Well, I might add to that, you know, and Tracy, you can speak to this better than me, but there, there's also something, in, at least in our work together, of how do you explore the, the ordinary and the everyday, which of course is most of our experience, right? And, and opera's all about, or not all about, but there's a sort of cliche that opera's about exploring the extraordinary, like, um, uh, the countertenor role in this piece, you know, we talked a lot about this, about, you know, countertenor sometimes plays these extraordinary characters like a duke or, you know, like uh, sort of otherworldly characters. And um, I, I think there's something exciting about the epic, mythic dimension of opera, the time-traveling dimension of opera where you can hear like a sort of 
80s rock song kind of chord progression and then some some fancy singing and oh, is it like is it poppy or is it is it 19th century you know that sort of confusion i think um i think is is interesting and it actually bringing that mythic dimension of opera into our everyday is something that is maybe counterintuitive but i mean i mean puccini was doing it so you know you know and so I guess it's, it's, it's in the tradition, but, but I like that. You know. And not all of us are encouraged to claim those, those stakes or those, the scale of the mythic in thinking about our everyday lives. And so what I really like about this work is that we're making space for what actually feels real, which is when you are lost, when you're, when you've, you're failing, even if you're nobody, that becomes the story of the world and an aria allows us to bring that psych psychological scale into public space, which I think is important. Well, good, well said. Well, thank you all for being here. Let's uh, have another round of applause for our amazing <laughs> singers and pianists. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. We, we are so happy to have you with us. We look forward to seeing you all at the opening of The Righteous on July 13th, 2024 at the Santa Fe Opera. Please come and see us. Thank you. Thank you.